Do you realise that today is Friday the 13th? Can you open with prayer, please? Lord God, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity we have here to study. Um, we ask that you would bless this time. Um, yeah, just that we may learn more about you. Heavenly um, Father, yeah, we just thank you so much for this. Amen. I mean, in our race through the Bible, we've had a look at the first part, the prologue, the introduction to Genesis, which is also the introduction to the Pentateuch. And the Pentateuch is the introduction to the whole Bible. Um, remember that the focus in Genesis 1 to chapter 2, verse 3, is God's, in God's ordering of creation. Um, there's seven days in which God was at work. No, six days in which God is at work. One day he rests. And in this way, God sets the pattern for human life on earth. Uh, that we work together with God and rest together with God. Now, the focus of this, however, is on God's resting. And it's very, very enigmatic, puzzling um, there. Uh, God not only rests on the seventh day, but he blesses it and he sanctifies it. So that that day will be the means by which he can give his blessing and his holiness to people on earth. How he's going to do that? Okay, watch the space. Um, and you remember um, that uh, uh, there's a pattern that's broken on that seventh day. Um, in which it, the, the day isn't closed off. There's no end to the day. Evening and morning, seventh day. Every other day is closed off. Now when we come to Genesis chapter 2, which I assume you've all read, have you? Yes. Okay, so we don't have to waste time to read it. Um, please do it, otherwise you miss the stuff. Uh, uh, we have limited time. Uh, Genesis 2, uh, the focus shifts, if you like, from, if you can imagine a television kind of, or movie shot, from the big picture, the big picture is enormous, the whole created world, the focus goes from the big world to the little world that we experience, the little world of human life. And when it comes to the way we live life, um, experience life, the focus is not on the cosmos, but the focus is on family. That's the centre. That's our world. You grew up with two parents in a house with father and mother and possibly brothers and sisters. But that's the way God designed it. That's the little world that we grow up in. And so... Uh, uh, there's, the story of creation is told from two points of view. There's from that big point of view and then from that little point of view, the little world of our experience. And uh, uh, there's something very interesting there that you um, uh, may have noticed. That the focus here is on God's creation of marriage as being the essential part of this. The story begins with God forming man, Adam, from the dust of the earth. Now, to understand this story, you need to see that there's punning here on two sets of Hebrew words. And you've probably done enough Hebrew, most of you, just to get the basic sense of this. Now, the word for a human being is Adam, Adam in English. Adam is a human being. So, uh, you're Adam, you're an Adam, you're an Adam, I'm an Adam. Meaning human being. But uh, Adam can also mean humanity. We are Adam. We are humanity, human beings. And thirdly, it can mean a male person. So I am an Adam, but Karen, you are not an Adam. In that sense, that doesn't mean you're not a human being, but you're not a male human being. Sometimes used, that's not very common. But then uh, uh, it's also a proper name 
for the first human male person. So you get Adam, Adam, and Eve. But the basic sense of the world word is Adam, humanity, human being. So in Genesis 1, which we had a look at, uh, we read or we hear that God created Adam in his image. What sense is Adam there? Humanity. And that includes all human beings without exception, male and female, because it goes on to say male and female he created them. Okay, that's the first word. So God creates Adam. I don't, this is the word that's used. And then there's a pun. There's a, a Hebrew word that's very closely related to that. Adama. Now, I don't know if you've done vowel pointings. A, D, M. The vowels aren't put here, they're put underneath. This is long A, long A. Adam. Now, the word for soil or ground, earth, earth not in the sense of planet earth, but of dirt, you know, the stuff that's out there, is uh, adama. Adama. Uh, ground soil. But uh, if you wanted also, there's another thing, if you want to say, uh, uh, there's a, a, if you want to indicate direction, in uh, Hebrew, you put a, a H at the end of the word. word. So uh, you could also understand other ma as to or from man. Huh? Uh, can you see the punning that's going on here? Yeah. Now, um, that's the first word, and notice the way it goes. Right in the beginning, God like a potter, shaped Adam from what? The Adama. This is where he comes from. Um, this is where he comes from. Adam from Adama. And uh, what God does is breathes into Adama, I mean Adam, the breath of life. So uh, Adam consists of two components, if you like. There's the soil, basic elements, uh, molecules, all that kind of stuff, physical side, and then there is uh, the breath of God. God breathes his own life breath, his spirit, into Adam. Uh, into Adam. Now, notice there's a pattern uh, set, and the story is this goes this way. Just have you got that? Okay, it begins in the beginning, uh, there was no Adam to take care of the other ma. Okay? The other ma can't take care of itself. It needs an adam to take care of it. So there's no adam to, to till the soil. So God creates man from what? Other ma. Adam comes from other ma. And then he creates trees from the other ma. And he makes a garden. Okay? So he creates, first of all, he, uh, uh, there's no man to till the ground. Then he creates man from other ma. Then he creates trees from other ma. And then um, God notices uh, that it's not good for Adam to be alone. And so God makes a helper as his counterpart. And then, first of all, he makes animals. And what does he make animals from? The ground. Like hum human beings, man comes from the ground, plants come from the ground, and then animals come from the ground. Notice the pattern that said everything comes from the ground, but then the pattern's broken. Um, animals aren't very good companions and helpers and counterpart to man. Now, man not in the sense of humanity, but male person. So God creates woman from man. Now, what, you know what the Kleinic principle is? 
Look for the unexpected. A pattern is set up. What would you expect in this third stage? Eve to be made from the ground, the soil. But that's when it's broken, and, and something very special is here said that you get woman created from man. Did you okay? Now, uh, what's the climax of this story? The creation of male person, Adam? Hmm? The creation of female. What's, what's, if you say, what's the crown of God's big creation? It's humanity. What's the crown of God's little creation? Family home? Woman. No, the crown, that's what it culminates in. Now, uh, what you get here is one of the most profound stories about the nature of marriage that you can possibly imagine. Uh, there's so much here, and I would like to spend hours and hours and hours unpacking the riches of this, but I'll only have to spend minutes. Okay, now do you see that that's the first part of it. Uh, the focus here on um, uh, family, home, workplace, the garden, uh, and the relationship between husband and wife. Which leads me to the second set of punning. Now, um, uh, in Hebrew, the word for a male person is ish. What are you? Ish. Ish. Okay. Now, the, uh, uh, the word, that's also then for man in that male sense. If you want to say male human being, you say ish. Uh, and then it's also the word for husband. My ish is my husband. Now, um, there's a closely related word, which uh, is uh, the word for female person, woman, wife. You get the word ish, and you put the ah at the end. Remember that ah ending is directional, meaning from and to. So a woman comes from man, and she's oriented towards man, whereas male person, Adam, comes from soil and his ori orientation is towards the soil. Now that's the punning. Have you got that in hand? Okay, uh, um, the first uh, part of the story shows the relationship between humanity, human beings, and the soil. Now, it's quite obvious that we are different to plants. We're different to animals. But the danger is because we are a little bit different, we forget that we are very, what we have in common with what? The earth, plants, animals. And, and that very interestingly, uh, modern science has proved that most, all the stuff that makes up this comes from there. Every single molecule that's here changes every seven years, I've heard it said. Um, I don't know if that's uh, still accurately so, uh, but uh, 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 if you look from one point of view, we are just a, f a physical entity. Atoms, molecules, physical stuff makes us up. Um, uh, but we're living, just as plants are alive, and we are animated living creatures, breathing living creatures, like animals. And of all the creatures that God made, the animals are closest to us, we're the closest to the animals. But all of us, plants, animals, and human beings, are closely related and dependent on the soil. Um, that's our habitat. That's the first point that this story makes. Um, now, um, but the main point of it is to describe and explain the unique relationship between husband and wife, male and female. 
Um, remember Genesis 1 said God created humanity in his image, male and female he created them, he blesses them and gives them a common task. That's what men and women, male and female, husband and wife have in common. Now we get the what are the differences. The differences between the two sexes are very significant. Uh, now, I want to just focus on uh, uh, three basic things. There's much more, but these are the main points I want to make. First of all, let's start off with you, Karen. And can you go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 22? Genesis 2, verse 22. Then put the Lord God by the end and the word from the word. He had a taken out of the man and he brought him to the man. Right up. Um Tuesday. Yeah, I'll talk about the rib a little bit later. But just first of all, uh, the God made the woman out of the rib. Now rib is not this part, but in Hebrew cellar is rib cage. So there's no missing rib, but the picture is of um, Adam, if you like, almost cut in halves and his rib cage then being taken to use to make Eve. Um, something odd going on here, but then God brings the woman um, to the man. Now in the ancient world, uh, the person who brings the woman to the man is the matchmaker and marriage celebrant. Who is the one that creates marriage generally and marriage quite particularly, every particular marriage? Who married you? Um, Pastor. Did he? The, no. Humanly speaking, yes. Yeah, he did. From a human point of view, he did. He was the celebrant. But you were married in a church? Yeah. And therefore, and, who? And God, yeah, sort of set us up. So, definitely. yeah, God is the matchmaker, and God is the marriage celebrant. And so much so that Jesus, paraphrasing this, said, "What God joins together, let no ma no one separate." Where does Jesus get it from? This passage here, number one, um, and this is not just Christian marriages. Wherever you have marriage, God is at work. God, the Creator's work. Uh, bringing male and female together. And that doesn't matter how marriages are made, uh, customs vary all over the world. So traditional Chinese custom, marriage customs are different to Aboriginal ma marriage customs and so on. Yes? There's a scripture somewhere, I think it's in Proverbs, it says, he who finds a wife finds what is good from the Lord. Yes. From the Lord. Yes, a favour from the Lord, which picks up. There's a lot more teaching on this. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a good gift from God. So God uh, creates the marriage. He's the celebrant. He gives. It's not your um, father who gave you away in marriage, but it's God who gave you away to your husband in marriage, Karen. Yeah? So he brings. God's the marriage celebrant. Secondly, can we look very closely at Genesis 2, 18 through to 20, please, Levi? To just read that again. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. I know. Now, there's three parts to this that's very significant. Uh, first of all, God says it's not good for man, Adam, to be alone. God didn't create us as isolated individuals. He created us in community and for community. Um, and so the first purpose of God in marriage is what? Companionship. companionship. Company. Um, companionship. Now, the second uh, uh, purpose of marriage is contained in the word helper. Uh, now, the word helper is, is understood in Hebrew and uh, in the whole of the Bible, a little bit broader than uh, in, in modern English. What's the basic sense that you'd have of helper? Um, helper? Dylan? It almost sounds like they're obligated to 
uh, help uh, sort of sounds more authoritarian, like inferior. You mean? Yeah, inferior. Yes. Yes. Right. yes. That's the sense for us. You know, I'm the main doer, and somebody else helps me out every now and then when I want and when I command. Now, for example, the Bible says God is my helper. It doesn't mean that. No. Um, okay? uh, it's helper a little bit stronger. Helper here means co-worker, partner. Uh, and uh, partner would be uh, uh, closer in English, but partner in work. So work partner. And that's the idea. A helper is somebody who works together with you, co-worker. If I wanted to translate it as it possibly could, is co-worker, except it, it doesn't have that idea of partnership. Co-worker could be that it's basically my work and somebody works with me, but I set the task. Um, but partner means that it's not her work or my work, but it's our, our work. Right, so companionship number one, working together in a common task. That's the idea of partner. So what's the second purpose of marriage? Is that you don't have to work at your life alone, but you work together, together with somebody. And, and we use the word work in a different context. Yes. The imagination of work is different. Yes, yeah, so when we think of work, we think of paid employment. Yeah. But what's work here? What does work here include? Love. Emotional, psychological. Yeah, that, the relationship stuff. But and I think very practically, that's very modern, that's very abstract. Oh, to, uh, to look after the earth, the continent. That's very concrete. This, that's the big picture stuff, little pictures. Yeah? Just living. Living together and doing what together? You know, all the stuff that you need to do in the house. Um, you know, all that kind of stuff. Not that it includes, you, you, in the ancient world there's no paid employment. Um, but uh, if you think what you need in order to survive, so it means, you know, having a house, taking care for a house, cooking, cleaning, looking after the animals, looking after the farm, uh, looking after kids, raising kids, uh, all, all that area of life is touched on there. And then comes, okay, you got that clear? So that's the second purpose of marriage. The third purpose of marriage is more enigmatic. Uh, we have here translated, uh, I will make a helper suitable for him. Sometimes it's translated fit for him. Uh, now we have here a word that is very odd surprising even in Hebrew and is quite impossible to translate adequately in English and suitable um, uh, is not too bad. Um, what's the idea of suitable? Works well. It works well. Yeah. Why does it work well? It's, it complements, fits to, it fits together. That would be why wives and husbands are always opposites. Aha, and that's the basic point here. Uh, no, uh, uh, in Hebrew, it's, it's quite literally, I will make a helper as your opposite. <laughs> but not opposite to oppose you, uh, but the... Uh, in the idea that you are opposite to me. Can you, you face me, I face you. So we are opposite. Uh, we don't both face the same direction, but we see things from two different points of view. Do you realize God designed us so that we only see half the picture? We, I can see what's here, but I can't see what's there. Um, uh, I can't see my own face, but somebody else, I, only somebody else sees my face. Uh, now, the picture here is of opposite, but an opposite that also, the idea is an opposite that complements. Uh, the picture is here of a circle. Two parts of a circle that complement each other. 
Compliment, not in the, with an I, but an E. Which, what does compliment mean? To praise someone. No, that's the I with the yeah. E. Oh, did you say with the E? Comp complete. Yeah. This comes from the word complete. Right? To complete each other. The idea is that we are incomplete human beings. Something's missing. There's not a missing link, but there's a missing half. Um, and uh, uh, God uh, makes us different in order that those differences will complement each other. You see the way it is? Um, so, uh, God said it's not good for a person, male person, to be alone. I will make a co-worker for him to complement him, to be his counterpart, to be his opposite, not the same. Now, those of you who've been married know something about marriage is that marriages don't work if both people are the on the same page. You need opposites. And yet you, but it can't be completely opposite. You have to have something in common as well as something that uh, complements. So what you have, if you're the same, is this need for this circle. Okay, that's the same part. But then the complement is that there's, there's two parts that need to fit together so that you don't occupy the same space. You don't feel the same way. You don't do the same thing. You do things differently. And even if that doesn't, is not the case when you, the relationship starts and the marriage starts, do you know if you, if you analyse a successful marriage, what happens more and more as time goes on? Yeah, we become the same. Look. Well, you don't become the same. That's what, that's what you'd expect. You know, two people living together with each other, influencing other, basically. You don't become the same. No. You become, you become, com you actually complement each other. You fit together. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's certain modern, trendy words like adjustment. Uh, uh, you adjust to each other. Like the hand, like hand and the glove, sort of. The hand and the glove kind of stuff. Yes, or yeah. the, the foot in the shoe. You fit together. So, yeah. um, suitable for him. Uh, compliment him. Uh, there used to be a, a phrase, and there still is in parts of the world where you get matchmaking, uh, we've got to find a wife suitable for our son. The word suitable would be this here. Yes, what? Okay, because what we think, what do we think of suitability? And it's interesting how we've reduced it, and, and I'll come to it because it's very tragic. We need, there's an enormous need for a lot of teaching on marriage, and we've got it all here in a balanced kind of way. What, when we think of, the modern word is not suitable, but compatible. <laughs> Have you heard that word? Mm -hmm. And as soon as you say compatible, what do people reduce to? Which area, which area of life? We are not... How compatible? Sexually compatible. <coughs> so one of the sad things that's happening in your own generation, and you'd know that yourself, is that people find out whether they want to get married by doing what? Sex before marriage. Sex before marriage to find out whether that works all right. And the assumption is if the sex works all right, then the marriage will too. Is that so? That is the biggest load of cobblers you could ever imagine. And if you don't believe it, just look at the stories of hundreds of people in our society. God did not design it in, in that way. And we'll come to it in a minute, what God's pattern is in that respect. Um, okay, now, um, uh, you understand this? I've spent some time just on that, that suitability, because of the riches of it. Any questions on that? Now, <clears throat> the third part is the, uh, uh, so you have God as the marriage celebrant, God's purpose for marriage, and then uh, uh, what kind, what's the unity in marriage? What kind of unity do you have? Um, let's look at the end of this chapter and go from 22, <clears throat> because I want to pick up one thing there, 
all the way through to 24. Uh, who's next? Uh, yeah, Brenton. Dylan. Uh, Dylan, Brenton. Uncle. Uncle, yeah, sorry. Look, it's going to happen like I'm going to Frank you and I'm going to Brenton you because I'm an old man. And the, the computer pro, the, 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 the uh, this is, this is full here. I'll call you James or Rob. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. There's no, there's not any room in my files up here anymore for new names. Yeah. Uh, uh, what did I say? Twenty-two through to twenty-four, please. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. For this reason, the man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become one flesh or cleave to his wife. If you've got a cleave. Old translation. Yes. <laughs> and that's far richer and fuller. Yeah. Okay, now let me just take this uh, 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 through with you. First of all, God uh, made the woman from the rib cage of the man. Now, this is not a scientific description. So, if 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 uh, uh, you know you, you you cut up my body, you won't find that I have one more ribs than my wife. Now you get a lot of jokes about the missing rib. Um, the, it's not rib here, it's not rib bone, but the idea is rib cage. Rib cage. Now what's going on here? Um, uh, the best explanation of this is given by the rabbis, the Jewish teachers, who said it's significant that God did not create woman from the head of a man so that she would be his head to be over him. He didn't create woman from his man's feet so that she would be under him. But he created woman from his rib cage so that she would be next to his heart. Now the uh, ah, isn't that lovely? <laughs> yes. Okay, it's St. Valentine's Day. When's St. Valentine's Day? Today or tomorrow? Tomorrow. Okay, this is this is your St. Valentine's Day uh, trick. Yes. He's got he's he's got all the theory. Now all he needs is the reality. <laughs> Yeah, just to cool off a bit. <laughs> okay, ribcage. Now, what, uh, I, I, just one other thing here that's very important, and very important for Paul's teaching on the New Testament, is uh, the idea here is that uh, Adam, the man, sacrifices, gives up something of himself for the woman, and then he receives what he sacrificed back through the woman. Now, sacrifice means that you give something. Um, and that's built right here into the very beginning of uh, marriage. So for a marriage to work properly, uh, how <coughs> does a husband need to treat and love his wife? As Christ. As Christ treats the church. And Paul says, how did Christ treat the church? He gave up himself. He gave up himself. It's not his life. He gave up himself for her. So he sacrificed himself for her. Um, so can you see here that sacrifice, and it's interesting the, uh, uh, that uh, where it's placed, sacrifice lies at the very heart of marriage. And what's most important on the male side of marriage because the normal cultural thing is the opposite. What do all cultures expect of women? That they sacrifice themselves to husbands. And that's sort of, for, and, 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 and you know, that's true, and that's not denied here. But the problem lies with men who don't, aren't prepared to sacrifice themselves for their wives, um, and aren't prepared to treat wives as partners. Uh, but treat as, uh, and there's two problems. Some men want women to be their bosses. Marriage won't work. 
Some men want women to be their doormats. Won't work. Marriage only works if it's a part, as not any kind of partnership, not a business partnership, but a, a, a loving partnership, which is self-giving, self-sacrificing partnership. That's the first thing, being made from the ribcage. Um, the second thing is, look at verse 23 again. Please, uh, Dylan, and read that. The man said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called a woman, for she was taken out of man. Now, um, one of the uh, strange things about marriage is that it forms a relationship which is closer to the strongest human relationships. What are the closest, you know, traditionally uh, for all of us, which is the closest natural human relationship? Parents. Parents, yes. Um, parents. It's what the ancient world would call flesh relationships. Um, in Hebrew, my flesh is not just this, but where this comes from, my father and mother, brothers and sisters, we share common flesh and blood. Um, Adam sees that, number one, that the, his wife, even though she is not his relationship, is as close as father, mother, brother, sister. Picky sister relationship. So you get that flesh relationship. But it's even closer than that because she's made of his bone. So this is flesh of my flesh and bone of my bone. Now, um, to understand this, you need to un uh, think with uh, very practical ancient eyes. Um, if you analyze a human being and the components of a human being, uh, what is the one part of the human being that, that is basic, fundamental, that lasts even when a human being dies? Hmm? The bone. So the bone of something, if you want to say in, talk in Hebrew, the bone of something is the what? Lasting part. The lasting part of it, which is the foundational part of it, the essence of something. The bone of the matter is the essence of the matter. Do you understand? So the bone is the building block, the foundation. Um, you know, in modern, if you want to put it in modern scientific terms, you'd have to put something like the DNA. Uh, uh, but that's far too abstract and, and yeah. mechanical. Bone is quite concrete. Can you see it's a very concrete picture? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so uh, what you get is a close relationship, which is not only a flesh relationship, but a bone relationship, if I can put it that way. Uh, so a relationship that is stronger than kinship. Kinship means family. Then lastly, um, oh, no, uh, she shall be called woman because she was taken from man. Notice that Adam names animals, but he also names his wife. Um, so uh, he calls her Isha. Why does he call her Isha? Because she's taken from him, Ish. So she comes from him and her orientation is towards him. Uh, uh, her identity is tied up with his identity. Her, uh, his identity is tied up with her identity. I don't know whether you remember, but Paul picks up this in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 when he talks about the relationship between men and women. And he says, um, no, even though we come... Uh, uh, yeah, Men and all human beings come from a woman and therefore they are orientated towards uh, their wives. So they come from their mother and oriented towards their wife. Lastly, can we read, and this is the very profound, can you read once again verse 24? For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and they will become one flesh. This is one of the most, no, not one, this is the most profound sentence on marriage that exists as far as I'm concerned. 
For a marriage to work, God says three things need to happen, and for it to work properly, they need to happen in this order. What's the first thing? And, and notice the surprise. Therefore, since God created marriage, since God created this purpose for marriage that he's outlined, now, what follows? What's the practical implications? What's the first thing? Therefore, a man leaves his father and mother. Now, what's funny about that? What's the surprise there? Yeah, the expected, the normal thing in all societies is what? The woman leaves physically her father, mother, family and joins the man and his family. She gives up her name and takes on his name. And this doesn't deny that. But for a marriage to work, you need, you need to do some work well, the opposite needs to happen. And why? Can you work out? And this is the hardest part. If, if, if you analyse where marriages go wrong, this is number one problem, which is not acknowledged very much. But uh, it's, there's increasing literature on this. What is, why do males find it so hard to commit? And you belong to a generation of males who won't commit in marriage. Some of you have, and you're exceptions. But on, generally, males find it very hard to commit. Why? Yeah? What's the problem? Have you got something? Well, I was just going to say before that um, it's the man's the head of the household, and if he's still under that, yeah. other, he can't be head of a new household while he's still with the other. Yes, that's true, but uh, and that's the second thing. But he can't be the head of the household because he hasn't, he's still in under the authority of father and the worst problem is mother. Now what messes, what's the biggest problem? Uh, if from wives point of view, most wives would say where marriage is going to trouble, the problem is that the mother-in-law, uh, I'm not good enough for her. The mother-in-law doesn't let her son go. And the son still not physically attached or uh, 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 locally attached, but psychologically and personally attached to the, his mother and also to his father. A male who hasn't got his own identity, his identity is still tied up with his father. He's still under the control, the authority, the headship of his father. And therefore, he cannot be a man properly. And because of that, he cannot commit himself, and the sexual side of marriage won't work the way it's meant to work. Right? Number one, for marriage to work, you have to have leaving. And the focus here is on the male side, leaving both father and mother. The most obvious problem is mother, but the deeper spiritual problem is father, psychological, spiritual father. Um, and uh, uh, I don't know whether you realise, and I've noticed this in the years that I've been working as a pastor in ministry, is uh, uh, we have a whole generation of men who, to put it in spiritual terms, lack their father's blessing. Yeah, that that right passage stuff. Yeah, that's part of the psychological, but there's also spiritual side to it. Um, and some people have identified that psychologically, um, but it goes far deeper than the psychological side, the Father's blessing. Um, therefore, they are uncertain about themselves. They're basically wimps. Marshmallow. There's no backbone to them. <laughs> I didn't invent it. I liked it. Number one. Okay, that's the first thing. And then the second thing, Brenda, a, a man, notice the male, leaves father and mother and does what? Is united. Bad translation. Um, uh, the Hebrew is stick. Cleave. Uh, but stick it actually means. Um, uh, davak means stick. 
and uh, he sticks himself to. Now, once again, what's the usual thing? The other way around. The female attaches herself to a male. And here's another big problem. <coughs> Needy women attaching themselves to men for various needs and uh, marriage being difficult and then uh, uh, relationships being difficult. Now, what is, how does a male cleave to, in practical terms, his wife? What's the cleaving? The sticking? What's the modern word for that? Actually, I've actually used it. Housework. <laughs> That's in helping. <laughs> the result of it is housework. <laughs> Cleaving. Cleaving. <coughs> Sticking. Committing. For marriage to work, uh, the fundamental thing is not whether the woman actually not only is prepared to commit but come uh, and commits herself permanently, but whether the male is prepared to commit himself for the rest of his life to a woman. And where does that happen? Um, when you actually get married. The, the marriage ceremony. That's, right. That's what it's all about. Um, you know, the whole uh, marriage ceremony is that. Um, and you'll notice that in the marriage ceremony, you, where you get the taking of vows, who's, who always takes the vows first? At least in Christian marriages, but in secular marriages it's, it's different. But in Christian marriages, first of all, the male makes his vows and then the female does. So uh, uh, you have to have a public, not a private commitment, but a public commitment, public cleaving, um, public break. Um, so marriage itself comes into it. And then the third uh, part of marriage is, and here you get a shift of subject, man leaves his father and mother, man cleaves to, clings to, sticks to, commits to his wife, and what happens then, and only then, they become one flesh. One flesh. Now, that one flesh, that's one of the most beautiful, odd expressions in Hebrew. It's surprising. You've heard it a lot, but it's unusual. What's all contained in that one flesh? Most obviously, most uh, uh, practically, what does it involve? Sex. Sex. Sexual intercourse. So they become one flesh. It has sexual intercourse, and it's the result of sexual intercourse becoming one flesh. But it goes bigger than that. I don't, it means having children. And thirdly, it means that you act, actually do become physically and in every other way one. And this is paradoxically because strangely, even if you have sexual intercourse, you're two physically separate persons. You do become one flesh in that you're uh, genes come together in your children, so there's that one flesh there. Um, uh, but the result of it is that you have this physical union between male and female, which is so strong that even death itself cannot destroy it. I've had two of my best friends, men, die, and both of their wives, in talking to them, what's happened to them, have said the same thing, the way they feel about it. And what they were surprised. They expected grief, their grief to be emotional, but their grief is not primarily emotional, it is physical. Have you heard what people say, couples say, when husband, yeah? yeah? Well, the second couple will usually die out. Sorry, what? The, the second person will usually die out sooner. If people are old, that's very common, but how, how do they feel? What kind of a loss? It's a physical loss. It's as if I'm cut in half. Or it's as if half of me is missing. Mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Um, uh, it's, it means if I feel as if I'm not all there. It feels as if I uh, have 
part of me amputated, physical, huh? very profound. Now, um, yeah, sorry? This may also be old school weddings. Um, they would like have the marriage ceremony and everything, and then they'll have like the reception downstairs while the bride and um, the groom were upstairs concentrating the marriage. Not within our tradition. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's no. no, that's 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 a bit fanciful, and it may have happened in some places, odd cultures, but that's not uh, the normal uh, 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 Christian practice. Now. Um, notice here, and I want to, I want to apply this because uh, this is one of the biggest problems that we face in the church, is, is contained in this. What's God's order? First you have leaving, then you have cleaving, and then you have one fleshing, if I can put it that way. <laughs> Not just fleshing, but one fleshing. There's a difference between fleshing and one fleshing. Um, what's the pattern that's becoming increasingly ingrained in our society? Not necessarily. And that's not new. Yeah. No, the pattern of how people enter. I, 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 uh, just on Wednesday, I had notice of intent to marry somebody who will be marrying in a month's time. And uh, it ceases to surprise me, a couple, a, this, uh, a nephew of mine and a girl. What are they doing already? The cleaving, cleaving bit before the leaving. No, the cleaving hasn't happened. Yeah. I fill in and then it's what, as I expect when it comes to place of residence. Same place. Same place of residence, they're living together. That's a common pattern. And it's become normative, and it's not just outside the church, it's come inside the church. And brothers, sisters, this is one is not just a, a, a marriage problem, this is a big spiritual problem. And this creates spiritual problems, and you'll have to clean up the mess as pastors, and you'll have to know how to clean up the mess, and how to tackle it. Um, and you could be legalistic and say, okay, that's wrong, I won't marry them, or whatever. But where do they start? Okay, this comes first. And then it varies. Um, uh, usually this involves that, but it's, it's uh, the, the leaving and cleaving very often are, are only in the marriage ceremony, that it happens publicly. So this first, and then you get this second. They live together, and then they decide to get married. And and very often the marriage is very, very touchy because of family problems, and then they've got to sort out the family problems. Third. Ooh, backwards. Can you see? It's doing God's order backwards. In a sense, this isn't wrong, but it's defying God's order, and it creates unnecessary problems and gives a very insecure basis for marriage. Reason. Sorry, what? God gives an order for a reason. Reason, and it's not to in, in order to deprive us of enjoyment. It's to give us enjoyment and blessing. Um, now, there's a, a wonderful book that I recommend very highly by a, a, a Lutheran missionary who worked in Nigeria, a man by the name of Walter Trobisch, who wrote a book called I Married You because he found that with people coming out of pagan background, the normal uh, relationship, the more normal way they did it was to get, do this first and then uh, this, and this wouldn't be, would be missing altogether. And he wanted to teach Christian marriage in a way that wasn't legalistic and that, wasn't, uh, that was winsome rather than alienating people. And the thing was that most of the young people that he was ministering to had been living together, having sexual intercourse. And he, therefore, to used this passage to teach Christian marriage, and he had two pictures. He said, there is a marriage triangle that God has designed. Okay, now, the point of entry is, or there's one point of entry, which is the... <coughs> 
leaving. And um, if for, the for, the, for the cleaving to happen, you need to leave. And that makes sense. Unless you've disentangled yourself from your father and mother, you haven't got yourself to give to your spouse. Leaving first. Unless you leave, you can't cleave. You can't commit yourself. The problem of lack of commitment. And uh, then second, third, so it goes to that. And it's only if you leave and cleave, commit yourself, that you'll have the trust for sex to work properly, the way God's designed. Sex will work, you'll still have sex. Doesn't, whether you're married or not, whether you leave or not. But for it to work properly and to have its, the blessings, the result that God wants for it, you need to have those things happening. So he spoke about God's triangle, or the other picture he used that the people liked, and he said this one works brilliantly in Nigeria. He said marriage is like a stool, but it's a stool with three legs. For it to stand, you can't have one leg. If you have one leg stool, it'll topper, totter. If it has two legs, you know, it's a bit more stable. But for it to be really stable, it has to have three legs, and then you can sit on it. Lovely picture. I would recommend this. I don't know whether it's still in print. You can, I've noticed last time I looked, I saw second-hand copies of it in Amazon. Um, there's copies, as far as I know, in the library. That's if people haven't nicked it. Um, because you're, uh, you're surrounded by this and you'll be ministering to people in this, this is the best resource that I know on this. Yes, uh, David. I notice you like, always put the, the one flashing in the people living together sort of in one. So... Do I put it together? No, no, no I noticed that you, you sort of did when you were yeah. talking, but what if they weren't? And okay, then it's even worse because then it isn't... Um, Okay, uh, <coughs> this hasn't happened. No, 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 no. But they're, they're and this hasn't happened. They've left home together. Yes. They're, they're not having sex and they're not married yet, but they're. And they're not even living together, and that creates. And you, as you know, for those no, couples. I'm saying they are living together. Oh, well, that's. And they're not this. doing anything else. Okay, this, for, for, only for this to work, for sex to work at all, mm -hmm. um, in any way, in any relationship that's not prom promiscuous, mm. you've got to cohabit. Mm. Uh, and it very quickly uh, runs out, unless you cohabit. It, so, um, uh, the sexual side in any way doesn't work without, properly, without cohabitation. Oh, no, 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 I was just talking about, like, okay, my wife and I, before we got married, we left home and we moved out. Yes. But we weren't, we weren't having sex, we yes. waited until we got married. And yeah. Yeah. So it's, well, that's why it's not, uh, there's no reference here of cohabitation because not all forms of cohabitation uh, mean the same thing. Mm. However, if you were living in New Guinea yeah. and you were cohabiting, do you know what people would have regarded you as? Okay. Married. Yeah. Or at least engaged. And once you're engaged in that society, there's no way out. So under no circumstances will a woman ever live under the same roof as with an unmarried man who is not her relative. And so there's problems in that society even where um, you get Europeans having you know, housemaids if they live under the same roof it's regarded as an engagement or as a marriage and so for that to work, you'll find out that the, what used to be that it wouldn't be under the same roof, but you'd have some maid's quarters out the back or something like that uh, to, because of that, uh, that uh, way of looking at reality. Okay, before we break, any, any f questions? I've taken far too long on this, but it's very important uh, for you. Let's have a break.